pitch it up a little bit today. So it says we're live now. So I see on Facebook. Here. Yep. We've been on for 10 whole seconds. Yeah, right, we're up and see. rolling. Let's see if YouTube's working. It is. There we go. Nice. Looking good. Well, well I'm going to yeah, We've already got a comment YouTube there. Today. We do. I, I can't. I Forgive can't me. I, I can't translate that, but if anybody yeah. can, go ahead, drop it in the comments. We'll kind of use this time to, to get rocking and rolling here. We're a little early, but my name is Captain Nick Pavlakis, and I'm from Marine Max in St. Petersburg. I'm a sales consultant and captain, so if you guys are looking to buy a boat or have questions about a boat in general, then come and find me. You can <coughs> shoot me a DM in the comments and and uh yeah i live here and this is captain keith lake coming to you live from the 30 something thousand square foot showroom here in clearwater florida uh god air conditioners cranking it's 80 something degrees outside it feels good in here so i just had a delivery this morning and uh wind's blowing a little bit but it's a good day out there what a change in the weather over this past week in florida huh keith i mean not to not to rub it in anywhere uh, why not? the country, but but man, it was 86 yesterday. I think my truck even read 90 because it was heating up, and, and I went swimming in a pool and everything. And uh, it, it's definitely changing down here. Oh man, tourists are here. It took me forever to get back over here to Clearwater yeah. from Apollo Beach on Saturday, and then all the pictures I saw on Facebook and everything, people trying to get over to Clearwater Beach and, and all that. It was a, a madhouse, but hey, that's you know. That's what we're here for, you know. It's it's good for us. So, hey, Kathy, see you joined us here today, this morning, as or this afternoon, as usual. Good to see you. Got people joining in from all over the world. We've got Jag Pimp from yep. Tucson, Arizona. Sorry he missed last week. It well, froze uh, in Tucson this morning. He said, "Wow." Well, it's okay. I'll forgive you for missing last week. I also. Missed last week and apologize for that. It I got caught up there with the helicopter photo shoot with the Aquila 54 and 70. And and you know how that kind of goes on the water. Deliveries always go longer than expected. Things are never as they seem. But it, it was well worth it and, and it was a great experience. But the reason I missed it was because I had everything ready to go. I was going to do the podcast right there on the sky deck. But right. we had to get fuel and everything and it was starting to storm. So it was winging it all hands on deck. They give you any kind of time frame when the the video and promo stuff's going to be released on all that? I think it'll be within a couple months, and and man, I I would be excited for it. That that footage is going to be great. We had a beautiful christening here at at MYSC, and the fifty four and the seventy are making their way down the coast right now. And I I know that the the seventy Aquila is down in Fort Myers right now. If anybody wants to go take a look at it, and and I've even heard rumors that the owners of Aquila 54 are making their way down the coast as well. And they're making a stop for lunch in Fort Myers today too. So there's, there's definitely a lot of great opportunities for first looks at a lot of these new yachts, especially, you know, with Marine Max down the whole West coast. So there's, there's a lot going on and a lot of it's in preparation as well for the Palm beach boat show coming up here at the end of the month. Yeah. Any of you guys uh, are going to be down in Key West later on this week. Got a, Sneaking suspicion that 54 Aquila is going to be down there too. So, so go check it out. There's uh last I checked there, we're up at hole number 30 or 31. I mean, I, I don't think it's even precedented in the industry to have that many boots sold out as the first one in the world hits, it's it hits the public eyes, but it's, it's worth it. Keith, what's your take on it? Oh, things phenomenal, man. I mean, I got to get on the 54 and the 70 You guys had an event at your store few weeks ago and you did the christening for your for the new owners on that 54 which was really nice um just spectacular incredible boats you know so done a really really good job they did it's it's definitely worth the hype well guys today what we're going to be talking about once a month we like to give everybody the opportunity to have Keith and I really just shoot from the hip and and let you guys drive the bus for a little bit. The discussion is up to you, so go ahead, drop those questions, no matter how far off the wall they are. 
Drop them in the comments, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube. We are going to get to all of them, or at least as many as we can. And, you know, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate you guys every week. This is Season 2, Episode 4, I believe it is. And we're coming up on a one-year anniversary of Voting Tips Live. So, you know, I I can't even put into words how thankful that we are for everybody. You know, last night, and and this is an honest, honest to God story, last night I was thinking, all right, tomorrow's Monday, back to back to work we've got a we've got a big week ahead of us we have a lot of elephants that we need to eat one bite at a time and then i thought you know what tomorrow we've got boating tips live there's a lot of people excited to see us we're gonna have a lot of good questions in it and it definitely made me realize how thankful we are for all you guys tuning in every single week yep and i remember a year ago like would have been sunday nick didn't get any sleep his he Mm -hmm. was so he still gets he still gets butterflies and still gets little. I do. I get nervous stuff. before every episode. But nothing like he was doing a year ago to where I mean he wouldn't sleep and couldn't eat and all that. So once we got knocked, good. A, knocked a couple of them out, hey, something worked, man. You're doing good. We're still here. So hey, let's kind of get to some questions. Well, because you know, people can't listen to the whole time. So um kind of as you come, as these questions come in, we'll try to get to the answers to them, you know, right away. Um Manuel Fuertes Jr. He's got a 33 ass of a 33 outrage. Can you I imagine add a second live well bait station? So on a 33, can you have two live wells? What you say there, Nick? Yeah, you can. So you're gonna have your transom live well, which is gonna be kicked off to the side, and then you're gonna have your wait. Yeah, no, yeah, you have your transom live well, and then you have the live well underneath the that table. That comes out right there towards the yeah, in the center of the cockpit. The seat, yeah. So yeah, which I mean, you're you're probably going to put the main baits that you're using in that transom wall. I think that that's the most easily accessible compared to the one that's underneath the seat. Yeah, but I don't think it's anything like you're going to add after the fact. You know, you want to have the boat specked or built that you know with that live well, mm-hmm. well in it. So, um. Connor Grew, thanks for joining us, bud. Says it's uh, 60 up there in Washington, D.C. That's his first live episode. So thank you for joining us. Hey, 60 thanks for in watching, Iowa, Connor. too, man. At Clone. Uh, At Clone 74. Uh, he's got a question. Is Sea Ray still making 60 foot boats? That's a negative. Um, they the biggest one they're doing right now is what the 400 slx yeah Um, they shut down their yacht production yep um and then actually boston whaler is expanding their footprint and they're actually moving up to where sea ray was making the yachts up in the palm coast area over on the east coast of florida so uh whalers growing like crazy so they're going to build all the the bigger boats and stuff up there at the old Sea Ray plant, and everything else will be, you know, down here at the down at the Edgewater plant. Yeah, I think that's an interesting take on the boating craze that's really going on. There's definitely a shortage of boats, and you know, it it, it is a big mixture of you got a high demand and a lower than usual supply because the supply chain is a little disrupted just with COVID and everything going on. But definitely a bold move by Brunswick, definitely a bold move by Whaler making that happen. But it, it is a bummer, and I get a lot of people bummed out that Sea Ray's not making those big yachts anymore. And and Keith, I'm, it was before my time, but you you were around in the heyday of especially Marine Max Clearwater when how many how many 48 sedan bridges did you deliver? How many um, 55 dancers or those big dancers did you deliver around the Tampa Bay area? And it's like, you know, that does with Sea Ray – not making those boats that definitely leaves a big void in that market here in the Tampa Bay area. And one of the things that I want to hit on, you guys hear me talk about Aquila all the time with Aquila power catamarans, but let's switch up gears a little bit. I think that Marine Max taking on the Galleon brand and the Galleon lineup really is a perfect, perfect replacement for those big yachts that Sea Ray was pumping out in the area, like your five ten skies and stuff like that. And, you know, your different HTCs and and those lineups of Galleon. I mean, they really hit the nail on the head by taking on that brand to replace those big sea rays, those yachts. Yeah, I mean, the Galleons are spectacular. 
you know, made in Poland, everything's done in house, nothing subbed out. Um, then the sky decks and the, just how the, you know, the, like the transformer type of a boat, man. You know what I mean? You know, the, the decks open up, expand in and out. Um, they're really, really cool boats, but yeah, you're right. I mean, back in the day, like you said, those 48s, the, the 55s, the 52s, the 50, 52 dancers, the sedan bridges. I mean, you still see them around, you know, you go to the, you know, St. Pete Municipal Marina or any of these marinas around here. I mean, the, we're still loaded up with them, mm. you know, I mean, they were well-built, big, solid, heavy boats, you know? Um, and, you know, you know, then they went to the L class and then they just decided to, to move on with that and kind of go down, I guess, with this, the smaller stuff to where, you know, it was easier to maintain and you're not relying on different manufacturers for different, you know, pieces of the, of the puzzle to put together on a boat. Whereas, you know, Brunswick, Sea Ray can control it all themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good point. It's, it's a whole different world up there when you get up beyond 40 and 50 feet, just as far as the yachts go. It's definitely different than just creating those day boats. But I think that you definitely have seen a, from, from a sales perspective and a captain's perspective, I think that you have seen quite a run of quality, especially in a smaller sea race, just with them focusing more on that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then definitely, you know, I guess it's different up north, but, you know, we talk about it a lot, but we've got, you know, definitely outboard heavy, you know, down here on the boats that we order, um, you know, LOZ up in the lakes and different places, you know, they still got the stern drive boats and, and all that, but that's, you know, that's good. That's part of the, the purchasing power and the, you know, the, the, the team we have over there at, up the street here at our team support you know, when they're, they're buying these boats from the manufacturers and, you know, can ship them out to different places in the country for, you know, for what they're suited to. Oh, I say it all the time. Whenever people will kind of really get in depth with me about taking on brands or stuff like that, I say, listen, there's a lot of very, very, very smart people of a team support that really, really know what they're doing. And if they're going to take on a brand, they're going to make sure that everything is very well calculated and, and they can get the product just as much as anybody or more in the industry. So while, while getting boots is hard right now, Keith, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. One thing I am fortunate to work for Marine Max is that if anybody can get the boots, it's going to be us. And, and we'll, we'll see if we can keep up really, but man, we, we have some killer questions coming in here on the side, Keith. Yep. If I we, see them. If, if we jump up to the last one, Okay, I guess we kind of got off on a tangent there from Acklone 74 about Sea Ray making 60 foot boats. Let's kick it off with this one. We have Connor Grew here, first time boater. Welcome to the family, Connor. Nearing purchase of a Sea Hunt Ultra 234 SE, likely dry storage in Annapolis. There is a longer lead time on canvas work. Wondering your thoughts on buying a more economical set of covers on Amazon until the canvas shop can catch up on the orders? What about covers for the Yamaha 250 outboard? Well, I'm not quite sure how it is up in Annapolis, Connor, but definitely in Florida, the number one thing that is going to make your boat age and look used is going to be the sun. This this sun is very unforgiving in Florida, so I always am a huge advocate for the covers for these boats, especially for the engine cowlings, too. You brought up the point with the mm -hmm. Yamaha. Th those cowlings will absolutely get roached in the sun, and to cover them up is well worth the money. You'll get it back. It's an investment. If you're going to spend even for a nice one, two to 300 bucks on a cover. I mean, you're going to get that back when you go sell the boat five years down the road because it, you know, the cowling doesn't look completely faded in the sun. As far as the canvas work, it absolutely is backed up right now, especially this time of year in the spring, whether you're seasonal or not, everybody wants their boats. They want their boats perfect right now. And, and, and just the industry in general is a little bit lagging because of, the boating craze right now but you, you can get cheap covers on amazon i had a couple folks get one for a 19 montauk here a few months ago and I, I mean i think that cost like 150 bucks and it was adjustable on a trailer and stuff like that i'm sure it's better than nothing and then when you get that custom canvas made you'll be you'll be ready to rock and you know if you're going to spend a spend the money for it make sure it's worth it and you know yeah and he, he mentioned, for many years yeah he mentioned he's going to be up in hunting you know dry storage too so I mean, my background, I've been here for over 19 years, but I've also ran, you know, high and dry marinas before I, I got involved with Marine Max. And, 
you know, even though you're putting your boat inside a barn up in a high and dry, you've still got the diesel exhaust, the soot and stuff coming off the fork trucks. Um, if you, if you're not on the top row, you know, you've got boats going in and out above you. So you're going to have stuff dripping on you. Uh, you can have the forks are going to bang on the rack above you. So whatever's on the forks is going to drop down on your boat. Um, and just, I mean, it's still, even though you're going inside, you're much better off putting a cover on it. Now, if you get a cover, like you're saying on Amazon and it doesn't fit really snug and super tight, it, it's not that critical because you don't have to worry about the rainwater pooling up in there. You're just trying to keep the, the soot and the exhaust and, and, you know, the, any of the incidental stuff that's going to, going to drop on you. So, you know, you don't end up with a stain on your brand new seat cushions from the, the boat above you. Um, yeah, you know, definitely cover it, whether it's inside or outside. Good stuff, Keith. So got a good question over there from Jag Pimp. How does the increase in fuel prices affect boat sales? It can't be good. I, I haven't seen. I, I think that we'll be able to really tell after the season, but I think that if if this whole March, April, May thing has taught us anything, that I mean it's always it's always gonna be time to buy a boat and, and everybody's always going to buy a boat. So I don't think there's really much that can, that can stop that unless, you know, we start seeing prices over four bucks a gallon. Yeah. I mean, right now, I mean, it had, has, hasn't gone up that much. Um, it's not going to affect the boaters yet. I mean, I've been here long enough. I mean, I've seen it where Marina you know, fuel was, was, it was over five bucks a gallon or whatever, you know? Oh but, yeah. I remember that. But, but people were, you know, we're still going. Maybe you just didn't go as far, you know, or you, you ran a little slower. You did things a little bit different. Right. But, uh, but it's, it's still not going to stop the desire and the passion that people have to get out on the water. You know, they're going. And especially right now, the way things are with, you know, COVID and, and, you know, so what we get two shots. They're still saying, Oh, you still got to wear a mask. You know, nobody, you know, it's who knows what's really going on. So, you know, get on your boat with your family and get out in the fresh air and the, the clean water and away from everything. And you know, so what you're spending an extra 50 cents a gallon for gas at the end of the day, it's, you know, doesn't really matter. Nope. Can't take it with you when you go, but good All question, right. anyways. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So musicians hot sheet. It's got a question here. It says I'm curious about spec draft versus practical conditional draft as in how accurate is depth sounding equipment in murkier conditions where you might not see a branch or rock at the bottom so being murky water that's not going to have an effect on on the transducers ability to do its job and, and give you the depth i mean Nick's kind of down closer to the beach. They got cleaner water down there. I'm up here in Tampa Bay along a little Allen's Creek running out of here, and our water's kind of dirty and brackish. And, it, you know, there's no, no bearings, no difference on that. Now, just remember, though, your transducer, for the most part, is on the stern of the boat, the back. So that's not like letting you know ahead of time, you know, what's in front of you. So that's where your chart plotter comes in. And if you've got it set up right, you know, all the depths on your chart plotter are going to be based off of low tide. And then there's different ways. If you go to YouTube, I've got videos on there, whether it's a Raymarine or a Simrad or a Garmin, whatever it might be, where you can go in there and change the settings on it to where the colors on the backgrounds are going to be a little different. The way I do it, I make the white, anything in the white background is going to be six foot or deeper at low tide. So you got your little black boat icon driving around on a screen. You got the white background behind you. It makes it super easy to see what's in front of you. And it's, you know, it's, it's plenty of water. I don't care what boat I've got here. Then it breaks down to where six foot to three foot is light blue, kind of the color of Nick's shirt. And then anything three foot or less is going to be dark blue like mine. So, and then, you know, you got your depth, even though you get your chart pull, pulled up, you've got your depth gauges on the, on the chart as well. So, um, uh, dirty water and, and all that stuff, I wouldn't worry about. And then your specs, check the spec sheets on your boat. So it may, it may say it's got a draft of two feet, 
but then that's going to be with the engine trimmed up. So, you know, you trim your engine down and, you know, maybe the prop and skeg hang down a, a foot, you know, lower than that. So you just, you know, you got to kind of do the math yourself. Or, you know, if you really get into it, you can set transducer offsets and sounder offsets and all that. But, but for the most part, your depths are going to read from the bottom of the boat down to the ground. And then if you've got a two foot draft, then you can add, if you jump in the water and it's reading four foot, it's going to be six foot deep when you jump in because of that extra, that V of that hull where that transducer is reading from. Good stuff. Good questions. A lot of good yeah. questions here. Got a lot of good YouTube questions as well as Facebook. Let's see. I need, we got Snake GS here on YouTube. I need a great day boat. First time day boater, 25 foot center console, Rabala 246 Cayman owner. Now five years. What do I get? 25, 250 to 500K. Well, there's a couple different ways that you can go i mean I, the question that i always ask when people come into the lot is are, are you planning on doing 50 percent fishing or less than 50 percent fishing because i mean if you're if you're planning to fish but you want to do a little bit of everything you can go five different directions with the boston whaler especially for that price range you can get pretty much whatever you're looking for and you know whether you're looking for a dual console that's going to be a little bit more gr gravitating towards family if you're looking for a hardcore fishing machine that might be a Boston Wheeler Outrage. I mean, for that price, I mean, you're looking you're looking at a 330 or you're looking at a 330 or a 280. And, and yeah, I mean, if you're looking more towards, you know, family oriented, I mean, you're looking at 32 DC or a 28 Vantage, something like that. But yeah, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question completely there, Snake, about um, first time Dave owner or if you've had a 246 came in for five years. Go ahead, come trade that boat in. Let me give you a little inside secret from a sales perspective is because we have such a inventory shortage right now, we will pay top dollar for your trades. Hmm. So if there was ever a time to trade your boat in, you might be able to make out pretty darn good where you might not have been able to do that good a couple years ago. So um, the dealers will do whatever they can to get a trade. I mean, there you go. Secrets out <laughs> and uh, call your sales guy or a girl and say, hey, what do you think my boat's worth on trade? Because it's definitely the value is definitely more than it it would be in typical time so that's you know yeah so he about. just chimed but he just chimed back in he's over in texas he's on the middle coast of texas 37 foot's the max he can go so well you got plenty of options there i i think that it, it really comes down to what type of boating you're going to be doing yep give our you know give the marine max uh what is it uh Houston. Houston. Yeah. Houston. There's one in Houston. There's one in Dallas. Where's that other one out there? There's one in Dallas. Is it NASA? Well, then there's, well, NAS. Yeah. Like, uh, is it Lake Louisville? Oh, yeah. Then there's, did, did we take over some sailing skis in Texas too? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, um, all right. What else we got here? Judette. Judette Jamila. Good afternoon. Hello. Is an FD-80 series yacht by Horizon considered an ocean crossing vessel? Oops. I don't... Tell you the truth. Let's take, let's you, take a look at one of these. You're going to look it up? Go yeah. FD-80. I mean, I don't know what the range... You know, definitely, you know, bouncing around through the islands or going through the Caribbean and and all that. Um, oh, yeah, that's a big old boat. You know what that kind of looks like? That looks like an Ocean Alexander 84R. It's a vertical bow style boat. I don't know. It's going to, I'd have to do some more research on that. I think that it's it's going to have to do with, with fuel range. It's definitely got the size. I mean, how many people do these big trips and trawlers that aren't necessarily that big or big sailboats. I mean, a lot yeah. of it's just going to come to, to fuel range really. Yep. Not sure about that. So it's 
Obviously, yeah. if you're considering it and thinking about it, just do your homework and, you know, there'll be a, you, you can find out. Um, Connor grew again. He has thoughts on having dogs on boats. Only two thirds of my way through boater safety course. Haven't seen anything yet. Dogs on boats are great. Mm -hmm. So, of course, man, man's best friend. Get your pups out there. So they, uh, you know, they wear, they even sell, you know, they, you can get life jackets for your dogs, PFDs. Um, you know, make sure your dog can, can swim, obviously. But there's people that, you know, we've got on Aquilas that actually live aboard that, live aboard with their dogs and mm -hmm. people will people will train their dogs maybe they're going on a long extended trip or whatever um like little pee pads or you can get like a piece of like a astro turf yeah the turf know. i've seen that a lot yeah and you kind of get the dogs used to going on that um it's definitely doable i mean the dogs are smart and they love boats yeah you, know, you got a lab man forget it it's all over <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny how sometimes I mean people really don't know how their dogs can act on a boat, but you know I I delivered a three forty five conquest to Wheaton Island a couple weeks ago, and the dog, I mean he he knew whenever you know that he heard the lift going, he knew that it was time to go on a boat, and 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 you really never know. I mean sometimes they just really take to it, and and there's no going back. Yeah, I mean I guess yeah, like some dogs don't like to ride in cars. I'm sure there's probably some that you know don't care for the boats as well, but, but yeah. for the most part, yeah, it's a natural fit. Good stuff. Yeah. We got Scott here. Uh, he's got another question. Have a 30 footer preference between seagrass versus sea deck. Are you familiar with seagrass Keith? I got a feeling it's like, uh, what do we call it? The, the, Oh man, that matting. Oh uh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, um, any woven vinyl. There you go. That's Stored probably in a high and dry. Seems like the seagrass would be easier to unsnap and pull out. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yep. Have heard arguments for both. Um, man, I, I've been specking out a lot of boats with both the sea deck and the infinity woven vinyl. I think, I think, okay, let, let, let's put this to bed here. Here's my opinion on it. Keith, I'm gonna let you weigh in. I think that anything inside I'd go with the infinity woven vinyl, anything outside I'd be going with the sea deck. And why is that? I just think that, you know, especially on the inside of boats, like the new Aquila 36 Cruiser Edition, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to clean. You know, you can unsnap it, take it out. This salt water a lot of times isn't the best for like a lot of that old carpet they were using. It's, it's oh, yeah, no, more... those, yeah, that, that old Berber they had yeah. and that, the, the black matting underneath it and the, yeah, it would stick. You, kept, you could never get rid of it. Yeah. It's it's a little more forgiving, like when you have Sea Deck on the back of a boat or something. I mean, you you can use pretty much whatever cleaning products you want on it. You can spray it off however you need, and it is it's definitely easy on the feet with the non skid. I don't know, man. It's just like I, I feel like inside. I feel like Sea Deck inside just is like it kind of it kind of messes with me a little bit. It almost feels like it doesn't belong there. It just seems like an outdoor thing. Yeah, I think the woven stuff is a little bit slipperier too. Yeah, yeah so like it is. Gotta, if it's it's wet or if you got like a little residual soap or something or, or sunscreen yeah yeah and the the sea deck is you got more cushioning with the sea deck and because you got different thicknesses you can get and uh it's it's you're probably not going to slip as much with that so mm -hmm. um i mean it's just personal preference on whichever way you want to go but you keep you know you can't go wrong either way really um cleaning it just a nice mild soap and just uh you know light bristle brush and go with the grain and just uh you know work it back and forth good stuff we got wtf mike here from youtube asking a question and down a little bit more he apologizes saying i apologize for my name my channel on youtube is based on things that make people say wtf my bad guys oh no uh, no good. apology necessary but we appreciate the good the good question we, we have a good question here keith that's that's generating a lot of curiosity within the whole industry. WTF Mike says, good evening, gentlemen. I got a question about Evan Rood, which, as a lot of us know, is previously stopped producing outboard engines. Do you gentlemen foresee a comeback from them, maybe in the electric motor market? Keith, why don't you weigh in on this first? I don't know that it'll be 
from Evan Rude, but somebody's yeah. gonna somebody's gonna come up with one. I don't know that you know once they sold out or not sold out, but you know ended the company. You know I don't know what kind of capital they've got or what they're still doing in research and development. And I mean that's a mm -hmm. takes a lot a lot of money, a lot a lot of backing. But would I be surprised to see Mercury or you know Yamaha come out with something like that or even Honda? You know, um, you know, and Suzuki, you know, that's basically the four, four manufacturers left in the game here, but mm -hmm. hands down, you know, the, the R and D, the research and development and everything that Mercury does. I mean, they, we just released, they came out with the, the 600 a couple of weeks ago. So, I mean, and the, golly, how long have they been keeping that one under wraps? How long have they been working on that motor? So when I, I mean, went up to Fond du Lac in 2018, they kind of, I don't want to say they hinted at something like that, but no, they wouldn't, no. Gabe and I, Gabe and I made a joke like, you know, Hey, like, cause this, that was right when they came out with the 400 mainline engine and, uh, they said something and Gabe looks at the guy and goes, all right, V12 confirmed. And everybody laughed. And the guy kind of looked at us and gave us, gave us a nervous laugh. Like, <laughs> uh -huh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and then look, now we got a V12. Who'd have thought? Yeah. So. They'll, they'll be coming down to pike, you know, that and diesel, you know, there's already diesel, you know, outboards, you know, especially over in Europe. Yeah. It's like right now we find ourselves in this great horsepower race and how exciting is that? When's it going to stop? Where is the, where is the ceiling? I mean, do you remember when Yamaha came with, a, came out with a 350 V8 and, and we were looking at that and we were like, man, can you believe that there's a small block Chevy engine tilted up on its side? What a time to be alive. And now 350, it's like, all right, they came out the 400, 425, 450, 600. I yep. mean, who's to say that there can't be a thousand horsepower outboard engine someday? I don't know. But I, I think that as soon as this, my prediction, WTF Mike, is that once this great horsepower race stops, alternative energy is going to take over. Now, is that in two years? Is that in five years? Is it in 20 years? I don't know. But it's definitely, I think, the most fascinating topic as far as the cutting edge goes is, is finding an alternative energy source for outboard engines or marine engines in general. But just hang, hang tight, sit down, put on your seatbelt, and, and just get ready for the ride because it's coming. Great question. So uh, Snake GS is back on here. He said, "No, no, no, no trade. He's going to keep that for his bay boat, but he's looking oh, cool. for a, looking for a family fishing offshore boat." So hit up your Marine Max over there in Texas. You got, you know, you got the conquests uh, and the the vantages. Either way, I mean, even a center console. I mean, you know, the, the, you got a lot of options there, and it's a you know they're great boats. Mm -hmm. Keith, how are we looking on our uh, Facebook viewers? I see on YouTube we got about thirty at a time. What's it looking like on Facebook? We're uh, mid twenties. Cool. Yeah, you know, constant. So not dropping down below that. So people checking in and out. Mm -hmm. so. Good stuff. Got a couple other questions showing up here. Let's so, see. Green Max got a comment. Hot there. sheet. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Keith. No, just you know, Marine Max. So if you go to our website, we've got several different boating articles and links and stuff like that. And there's a link in here actually uh, about pets and boating safety and, and all that stuff. So, um, all right, now we jump on over to mus Musicians Hot Sheet here. Um, Boston Whaler seems like the most awesome I've seen for both fishing and entertainment. It's Sea Ray features with sporty ready function the sport ready function so it's a it's a it's a good way of putting it i mean it's the sea ray or the the whalers the the, the fit and finish you know i'm gonna say second to none mm -hmm. you know and the, the the big garage seating let's say or the backrests and you know the quality of the cushions and all that and then you know if you me and the boys were going to go out fishing and we want to leave all those cushions at the house you know, you know, snap and go. Then you get the casting deck. We're up there slinging a cast net around and, and doing all that. So, I mean, that's the one thing Whaler really is. I mean, it's a great, 
great combination, family friendly, do it all boat. And, and it's a common misconception amongst folks nowadays. You know, they'll, they'll make the joke when everybody thinks Boston Whaler, it is the unsinkable legend. You know, everybody thinks about the Whaler being cut in half and still floating. And, and, and a lot of people are under the impression that you can't do that on a 420 outrage. You can't do that on a, on a 350 outrage or a, a, whatever it is, a, a big conquest. Yeah, it's true. You can still, a Boston Whaler is 100, 100% foam filled. You can still cut it in half and it'll still float, but don't, don't be fooled. And this is, and this is something I like to preach about Boston Whaler. Don't be fooled by all the frills and the, and the plushness. They're still a well-built fishing machine and are very yep. utilitarian. And I remember, I shouldn't even be telling this story, but we had a 40, a 420 outrage here last year and i really never spent a ton of time on one and they're they're expensive i mean they're an expensive center console and 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 i told you know somebody else in my office i said the only way to justify spending over 1.1 1 million dollars on a center console i gotta see what it's all about and and i'm gonna tell you i've got some videos here of me taking a 420 outrage out of passive grill when it's not so nice I mean, I mean, that boat is a beast. I mean, you, you come off of waves and you brace for impact and it just wouldn't come. And it, and it definitely, definitely, definitely justifies the price tag that it brings. And I think that all whalers really do, especially when you look at what they're going for on the used market right now, when there's a lead time, like it is on, on new boats, you look at what used whalers are going for. And I mean, there's people that are you know, breaking even on used boats. It's, it's pretty crazy. So there's a huge following for them. They have great dealer support, great customer support, and there's a huge following on Facebook as well through different owners groups. So don't don't be what I'm trying to say is don't be fooled by all the plushness. They're still they're still just as utilitarian as they ever were. They're battle wagons. I mean, they're it's it's a beast, man. So they're they're great, great boats. You just can't say enough. I mean, you know. Hey Keith, read that question there towards the bottom. Oh uh, golly! I'm not going to read it out loud. Herbuds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That's way better. Sure, we would. Yeah, for good. Uh, all right. Oh see. man, we have some serious questions coming. Yeah, up. we got to have an hour long episode. Cool. All right. Well, first things first, Kevin Rose, why do H E double hockey, hockey stick our boats so expensive? They just are, and it's it's worth it. It's definitely an expensive hobby, but it's not as expensive as you might think. You don't need to be out there in a million dollar yacht to be boating. I mean, you can boat just as good in a in a Ginu or a or a thirteen sport or or whatever it may be, maybe something used that you come across and you can have just as much fun in a John boat sometimes as the guy in a hundred foot yacht. Absolutely. It's the great equalizer. You know, I mean, that's what I've, I say this all the time. You know, you go out to an island and there's a guy out there like in that 42 outrage you're talking about, right? That just spent $1.2 million. And then you've got somebody pulls up next to him in their 19 foot bay liner and they're doing the exact same thing, man. And, you know, you walk over and you shake hands and you see each other, you know, it's, it's a family. It's a, you know, our, our slogans united by water. Mm-hmm. And that's truly what boating does, right? It brings everybody together and, you know, one, you know, somebody's a doctor or somebody else is a brick mason. Somebody else might be a dog groomer. Who cares who, you know, you're out there because you love to fish. You love to go get away from everything, get out on the water, take your dogs to the beach. You know, it's just, it, you can get out there a bunch of different ways. There's a bunch of different price points, new boats, used boats, and all that. I mean, here at Clearwater, we took on the Nautic Star line. I've got, you mm-hmm. know, I do have some of those here in stock. You know, they got the hybrid boats. I got a couple of them delivering this week. Um, you know, they got the center consoles. They got the the bow riders. There's a bunch of different options that that you know you can you can go. There's two the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah, and and it's all relative too. I mean, it's. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've been on a $50,000 boat and they'll look at the million dollar boat and say, man, it would be, I can't believe, I can't even fathom having a boat like that, you know, on a million dollar boat, 
you're going to look at the $5 million boat and say, man, someday sure would be nice to have something like that. And it never I, stops. It never stops. It doesn't matter how big or small of a boat that you're on. I will personally guarantee you this though. You, somebody that buys that $25,000 boat or somebody buys a $2 million galleon, you're going to get treated the same at any of the Marine Max stores you go to. I don't care who you are. You walk through the door, you're part of our family and it's, there is no hierarchy or, oh, this guy spent this much money or she spent that much money. Everybody is going to be treated the same. You're going to have the same stuff on your boat. You're going to have a go boating kit. You're going to have everything you need ready to go. You're going to get an orientation. If you buy a 13-foot Super Sport, you're going to get an orientation on that boat. If you buy the 510 Sky, you're going to get an orientation on your boat but it's not going to be, there's more systems. It's going to take longer, mm -hmm. but you're still going to get treated the same. You're absolutely right, Keith. And, and, you know, from a salesperson's perspective, if I have a 17 Montauk customer that calls me on a weekend or a 44 Aquila customer that calls me on a weekend, I'm going to answer the phone call just the same and yep. put just as much priority. In. And, 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 and that, and that truly is the way it is here. And, and, and the last thing that we ever want to feel like is that, you know, if somebody's not buying a million dollar boat that we're not going to treat them like such because everybody's getting a royal treatment and, and a bunch of different people can vouch for that. We've got a ton of good questions here on the side, but there is one in particular that I want to get to. It's all the way down. We've got it from wow, look at all those questions. John Dunn. And, and, and I'm very excited to talk about this. So John Dunn says, can you explain the setup for managing the tenders on the Aquila 54 and the 70? And please describe the new tenders from Aquila, please. Great, great, great question. So we'll start out with the, with the 54 system. So basically how the 54 system works is it's on a beach, right? So there's the back of the boat and there'll be videos online too and all the marketing material, but there'll be... The boat is up on a platform, and then from the bridge, there is a boom that comes out, and it's just a straight line. It's not pivoting or anything. All it's doing, it's so simple, Keith. Literally, it comes out about halfway, hook up the bridle, put it on the back, drop it down. That's it. That's all you got to do. When you put it back up, boom stays out, brings it up, comes back in, drops it down, bridle detaches, Boom hides away. You can't even see the boom. You cannot see any of the Davit system for the tender on the 54 when it's not in operation. Very cool. 70 is a little bit more like a conventional yacht. You drive the boat. There's the back of the boat on the 70, and the platform goes down like that, and the tender oh, just cool. dri drives up on it on a winch and then, and then tucks away in there. Very cool. Very, you know, one person can do it on both boats. The Aquila rib is super cool. It's a 14 foot boat. We got, we've got one on a 54 and one on a 70. It's, I mean, it's a baby Aquila. It's a baby catamaran. It really is. And, and they're going to mainly come on a 54 and a 70 if you spec it out as so, but you know, like, like the typical things that you're going to get on a, on a catamaran, you're getting more of that space. It's going to handle like such. It's a fun boat to drive with a 40 horsepower Mercury. And it, it really is a uh, match made in heaven. So we're going to, I'm sure we're going to see some more stuff from the marketing team here soon on the different systems or maybe some separate interviewers there on YouTube, you know, some boat test guys or whatever it may be. But that's a great question, John. And, and I appreciate you answering it or asking it so we can answer it. It's a great explanation. I just learned something. So thank you. Yeah, they work, they work really well. We're definitely going to have to write down some of these questions to get to them next week. So apologize if we don't get to some of them today, but we'll have our, our man behind the curtain write a lot of them down so we don't miss a single one. So JP's got a question here. So are there any plans from Sea Ray to develop a 36-foot entirely enclosed coupe to compete mm. with the Regal Grand Coupe? So no, I've, I've had that question before. So there's some 35 coupes out there, right? That got the. It's a totally enclosed, though. You know uh, who would know? Neil Plummer would know. Yeah. Yep. We sold a few of those. But as far as you know, C Ray, what they got in the, in development or in the works, we're not privy to, to that stuff. But uh, 
No, you know, who Wh- Whaler and C Ray both do a exceptional job of really keeping things under wraps. Mercury too, you know, at Lake X. Yep. I mean, we really don't know that much more in advance than everybody else. So Ackline 74 has got a question. Is Formula a good boat company? Absolutely they are. You know, they've been in business for a, for a long, long time. and been building, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of great boats. I can't, you know, I can't knock it. I have a survey on a brokerage one on Thursday. Cool. What size? 40 footer. It's the... It's the IO version, not the straight shaft version or the pod version. It's uh, not the PC, but the 400. I believe it's a 400 Sport. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check on that. But cool. it's a uh, good good friend of mine that Justin Lindhorst took the listing on, and it's under contract. So I uh, I think it's a pretty nice boat, actually. Um, Mark Cat. Oh, here's a good one for you, Keith. This is a good one for you. We got Next Center. Next end here says tips on coming alongside with two engines. Where are you looking at here? Uh, let's see. Just under WTF Mike's comment. I mean, let's talk twin engine boat handling in general, like, like excluding a bow thruster or anything, just some different tricks to making it look like you've got a joystick when you're really just working the sticks. So the most important thing to do is, look back if you got outboards or if you've got a autopilot and if they're inboards you can see that your your drives or your props are straight you got to have you know you make sure those are straight and then it's just like pushing a grocery cart or if you've ever you ever run a bobcat you know where you got to you know push forward and pull back to twist around it's the exact same thing kind of kind of the way you twist your shoulders so if you're sitting dead still in the water and you want to give yourself a port turn to port, you're going to push your starboard throttle just into forward gear. That's going to give you a little push. That bow is going to start going around to the left to port. Now, if you want to speed that spin up, then you're going to pull your left stick, your port stick into reverse. And then that's going to pull the port side back. You're pushing the starboard side forward to get that twist going. Um, Just the physics of the way the propellers are cupped if you move them equidistant, you're still going to be creeping forward. You're not really going to be sitting still and pivoting in one spot because that forward facing prop is grabbing a lot more water. It's made to move the water. So to hold yourself still in the, in the spot, just to do an actual 180 or 360 or how many ever times you want to go around, you're going to have to give your reverse throttle some extra, extra fuel to make that prop turn faster to equal the volume of water that forward props pushing. So you can, you can kind of manage it and adjust it that way. And then when you're backing into a slip, it's real easy because you can actually you yourself stand up, turn around, face the stern of the boat, put your hand on your shifters and just like one at a time, you can just kind of walk it in there. But, but visually you're not having to look back, twist back, look back over your shoulder. You can see what's going on and just like you would if, a, if it's a joystick boat, you know, mm-hmm. turn around and put that thing in your, in your hand and face what you're doing. We've got another, <clears throat> excuse me. I've got another question to piggyback off of that from Bruce Edmonds there. Can you explain the difference between three outboards motors versus two? What are the benefits? So Keith explain, this is something that I've always had a tough time understanding and explaining, you know, you got an odd number, you've got three engines, but you've only got two throttles. So how is that working? How is the brain thinking when you're working the sticks back and forth, but you've got less sticks than engines. So how, how is that working? All right. So you've got two shifters and two, th- two throttles, right? And you got three engines back there. If you take them and you push them both forward, all three motors are going to go in forward gear. You pull it to neutral, all three obviously go to neutral. You put them in reverse, all three are going to go in reverse. Now, if you go back to that neutral position and you push your starboard throttle handle forward, the only engine that's going to go into gear is that outside starboard motor. Okay? The center and the port are still in neutral. Now, if I pull my port one into reverse, that port engine is going to go into reverse. My starboard one's still forward. 
that center engine is still sitting in neutral. That center engine doesn't do anything unless both the outside motors are either going forward or reverse. It won't do anything. That's with the do using the shifters. Now, if you're using the joystick, that's a little bit different. The computer will kick in and it may use some of the torque and stuff from that center engine to help maneuver. Like if you want to push the boat sideways, but if you separate out the throttles, only the outer motors are the ones that are going to go into gear. That middle one sits right there in neutral and doesn't do a thing. Interesting. Another thing that I notice as well on triple engine boots is, I don't know if you ever noticed this, Keith, but so on a, on a triple engine boot, each individual engine is going to have a separate, um, I don't know if it's, what is it, a steering pump or whatever. Now, on like a 420 Outrage, a quad engine boot, it's going to have only two of the, I don't, know, I don't know if they're a pump for or a control for a joystick. So basically on a quad engine boat, you're going to have two because those are always going to operate in twos on a, on a four engine boat. They're going to, they the do now engines. Oh, really? Did it not always do that? Yeah. Yeah. There was, I think the first ones that came out, I think all four were like independent, but now they've got it down wow. to where the, where the two are tied together. So huh. four engine, it works just like two. So, yeah, I didn't know that it wasn't always like that. Yeah. yeah. And also the benefits too, of you know, three versus two, if you know, you're offshore and you're running in and you lose an engine, mm-hmm. you know, you can pull that engine that you lost, trim it up out of the water. You've got individual trims, mm-hmm. you know, using your thumb on the side of the throttle is going to do all three of them or all four of them or all five or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But on the leading edge of the binnacle, you've got the individual trim controls. So if something happens and I lose my starboard engine, I can shut it off. I can pull that one up out of the water. And then, depending on the boat and the horsepower, hopefully you can get the boat up on plane and just run in on the on the two or or the or whatever. You just get the dead one up out of the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, more often than not on a triple engine boat, you should be able to plane with twin engines. Uh, let's see. Got got a good question. We got another Aquila question here from I am better nine 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 Captain Nick. What's the best Aquila thirty six engine slash AHG or Aquila Hydroglide combo? Best thing for your buck: the twin three hundred Mercury's naturally aspirated V eight with the Aquila Hydroglide or twin four hundred horsepower supercharged with no Aquila Hydroglide. Cost wise, does 300 horsepower with a foil give better economy? So this is, man, this is an awesome question here. There, there's going to be pros and cons to both of them. To give give everybody else a little bit of insight and visibility about what what he's asking is on the Aquila 36 Power Catamaran. There's a couple different options that you can go with. There's the Hydroglide, which is the foil version, which is super cool. Maybe the man behind a current can drop the link in the comments. But there is the Hydro foil on on these boats, the AHG that is available with the naturally aspirated 300 horsepower engines. And what it does, it's really neat. It, it almost lifts the whole boat out of the water. You're increasing fuel economy by 30 or so percent, and you are seeing a top end speed, which is just about what you're getting with the 400s. Um, but you're getting the increased fuel economy. Now, the V8 300, that's an awesome engine. It's it's a relatively new engine, naturally aspirated. You're you're getting better fuel economy, you're getting better torque, you're getting better low end. However, there is something to be said also on the other side of things, getting maximum horsepower on your boat. You're sacrificing that hydrofoil, but what you are gaining with a non-foil boat, which you'll do with with 400s in that case, is you're, you know, you're dealing with a supercharged engine, which has a higher RPM range. You are going to be burning more fuel, but, you know, you are having more horsepower. And the supercharged engines, hey, listen, I'm just as much of a of a freak about the new technology coming from Mercury, but there's something to be said about a fifth generation supercharged Verado. It's tried and true, and and it really is a toss up. There are plenty of pros to both sides, but I would definitely recommend it if if you are that close, call up your guy, whoever it may be, or girl, 
and get out on the water and, and just and just go check them out. Go drive them. Because another thing, the foil rides differently than a non-foil boat too. An interesting thing there, and I did this with BoatTest.com not too long ago. When you when you drive an Aquila 36 and you and you turn that boat, it, it's a little strange for the first time turning a power catamaran because the boat's going to lean in opposite direction to what you're what you're used to. And and when you're on a foil, what I've noticed is you know you're riding up a little higher, you are staying a little flatter in the turns, and and it's definitely a different boat driving and boat handling experience having that hydrofoil down there. So. Um, definitely a ton of information about it. Lex and the whole gang over at Aquila did a phenomenal job with all the innovation going on over there. And, and it's definitely worth checking out and, uh, who knows, maybe you'll see it on some other models someday. That was technical, man. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. And then there's a, the, uh, Marine Max did put a link in there too for that. So, um, Back to uh, hey, so musicians hot sheet. Would it be possible on a three engine to only start the two outer engines, trim up the third, and save it for emergencies? Uh, see any improvement in fuel efficiencies? No, uh, not really. I mean, no. Um, nah, just if if you're maybe you're slow trolling, you're king fishing, you're doing something, you only want to, you know, have your you know one engine going maybe to go real slow, but. You know, more in that case, you're going to leave those other engines in the water anyway to help slow you down and create a little drag. So it's not really going to get you anything. I, I wouldn't really recommend, you know, popping one up out of the water and running around. Just, you know, and then you're going to have to run those other ones harder, you know, higher RPMs to make up for it. So now nah, use if you got three of them, use all three unless you get in a jam, you get an emergency where something breaks down. Um, WTF Mike. Thanks, guy. He's thanks, buddy. He goes, uh. Hit the like button, everyone. Help these guys out. It helps the analytics push their channel out. So It does, absolutely. It uh, Like, subscribe. You, who knows how the algorithm works? I know it changes every other week or something, but all the, uh, all the exposure is definitely good for us. It's what keeps us going, keeps us, keeps us here every week. Before we get off, Keith, man, this hour has flown by. We have four minutes really quick. How many deliveries do you have coming up this week? What are you delivering? And how many of them are 320 Sundancer outboards? One. Only one? Typical. Three, 320 is going Saturday. Cool. Uh, before we sure, log sure on. you're not delivering the same one over and over again? Yeah, no, man. It's it's different. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so this morning I did a 270 Sun Deck outboard. Mm -hmm. uh, nice boat. 300 Merc on it. And then uh, let's see. Tomorrow, I'm actually going to go through a boat real good with a fine tooth comb. It's a 38 Realm and nice. beautiful boat. I mean, that boat's loaded. It's got everything on it. So uh, that's delivering on Wednesday. Uh, I've got some Nautic Star hybrids. I got uh, 19 Montauk looking here. Um, there's all kinds of stuff coming. So, I mean, we're we're stacking them in here every day. And then as the new boats come in on the, the transports, all shrink wrapped up, pre-sold stuff come in cut them open get them to our service team and get them prepped yeah it's a pretty quick turnover for sure so so what do you got going on the rest of the week i have a 17 montauk delivering tomorrow going over to tira verde a quick repeat whaler owner quick orientation on the floating dock and, and he'll be on his way Going to Captiva this week in the South Seas with a good Aquila client of mine. We're, we're going to go down there on his 44 and really looking forward to that. South Seas does a fantastic job and hopefully this front holds off and isn't too bad. I'm going to leave Friday morning and hopefully I can beat the front before it comes all through Saturday night. It's actually looking a little bit better right now. It seems like every time I go down, the weather's horrible. Um, had this 54 cool. delivered doing its 54 tour down the west coast of Florida. So if you see it out there, go and say hey. Shoot, man, and, you might meet up. You're probably going to meet up with them then on their way back up then this weekend. Yeah, there, there's a good chance. I know that some Aquila owners are talking and they're putting on a trip. And I and I think there's even, shoot, Keith, I think there's a galleon rendezvous in Key West this weekend as well. Yeah, I think so. So a lot of stuff going on. A lot of action going on. A lot of Marine Max boaters out there. Like we talked about before, do not forget to hit like, subscribe, so you don't miss another episode again. You can find us. Every single week here on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, 
Spotify, Apple Music, all the iHeartRadio, all the streaming services. Go ahead, stream us, drop questions. We'll get to all the other questions next week. And next week, we have a special guest. We're back to the guest. It is Your Marine Audio Questions Answered with Aura Freeman from JL Audio. Going to get you all right for sandbar season. Going to get you cranking the tunes, and you can crank that Jimmy Buffett, that Tupac, whatever. I really don't care, but... But JL is is definitely top notch. So Keith, what do you say? Yeah, and then even though it's JL and stuff next week, still Nick and I we can talk to you guys about anything. So mm -hmm. bring your questions. Uh, sorry if we didn't get your questions answered. There's a couple of them over here I think we didn't touch on, but we'll uh, we'll write them down, and hopefully you're able to to join us next week, and we'll try to cover those and. Uh, just want to say thank you, and we're both, like Nick talked about earlier, we're both incredibly humbled that you guys uh, take an hour out of your day to, to join us, and just want to say thank you, and we'll see you out on the water. Bye, everybody. See you guys.